The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. It's quite a long lectionary text, and perhaps it lends itself better to telling than reading, so I will only read one verse of this long text. And Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Now the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the living word of God will stand forever. Amen. Will you please be seated? And before I begin, I want to thank all of you who sent cards at my so-called demise. And the rumor is not true. I did not die. That may have been your wish, but I'm still here. And secondly... And it's through a great cloud this sermon is written. And I promise you. So anything you hear that does not square with the gospel you know, and take it with a grain of salt this morning, and I apologize beforehand. And thirdly, the lesson in the Old Testament is be careful when you read the Old Testament. Let us pray together. Only through your Spirit, O oh God, can we hear and respond. Pour forth your Spirit as you have promised that where two or three are gathered, you will be also. Amen. I am not fond of formal dinner parties. Now, I will tell you, first off, I'm not speaking about the parties where you go over to a friend's house and you sit down to a common meal. Now, how do you tell when you're at a formal dinner party? Well, you look down at your place setting, and if there are more than two forks, you have moved into the world of formality. I function best at one forker's. We get into two forkers, you may have company, but three fork and more dinner parties, I am out of my element. When my wife and I had been dating for a little while, it was apparent that it was getting serious. So I was invited for a formal dinner party with her family here in San Antonio, at her grandparents' house, full of all kinds of antiques. They called it Thanksgiving. I called it trial by fire because I felt like I was on trial, not that they intended to put me on trial, but all eyes, since it was my first appearance, were to be on me, how I could handle myself in a social situation. It was a three-forker. And after about 20 minutes, I felt like I was holding my own. And the conversation was flowing. And I began to relax. And so, at that time, I lifted a lot of weights. And I had a larger upper body mass. So in my relaxation, I just leaned back against this 150-year-old Duncan Fife chair, and it exploded. I mean, wood exploded out of that chair. Now, what would you do in a situation <clears throat> where the only one you knew was 
to be your prospective bride, and you were on trial. You would have done what I did. I got up and walked out of the room. I still to this day, if it's got more than two forks, I become a nervous wreck. I have friends that love to host these formal occasions and overheard how they plan for uh, hosting one of these events. And there are two most important things. That's the wine list and the guest list. The guest list, according to them, takes thorough going through because you don't want somebody that just doesn't fit in the flow of conversation. An obnoxious person, one, can destroy the whole table and a few sentences. Jesus was invited to a three-fork dinner party. And all the cultural and social protocols have come into play. There were unwritten rules then, as there are now, of how to act in those situations. When the guest arrived on the scene, it was appropriate for the host to come to the door and kiss the guest and embrace them as a, as a means of welcoming them into their household. It was a kiss of peace and the party began that way. And then secondly, the host would provide water. Water to wash one's feet. Now you have to remember, they wore sandals. And you can imagine what people's feet looked like, or try not to imagine it. Uh, what they looked like in those days. Pretty gnarly, pretty dirty. And oftentimes, if they were wealthy enough, they would have a servant wash their feet for them. And thirdly would be the oil of anointing. And there is symbol through the whole of Old Testament literature and New Testament literature about the oil anointing. It was, in a sense, spiced oil, perfumed oil. That, you got to remember, they didn't have showers on every corner. It would make them feel not so self-conscious about the way their hair smelled. And none of these was done for Jesus. That is significant. Simon the Pharisee singled Jesus out. He wasn't like the rest sitting at table. He wasn't even their equal. As a matter of fact, I believe Simon had an agenda for this dinner party. It was to expose Jesus as a fraudulent prophet. Nip it in the bud, the problems he was going to cause. Call into question his credibility and do a wholesale character assassination on him. He'll never see it coming. At least that's what Simon thought. Enter a woman into uh, this party. A woman crashes this formal occasion. It wasn't one of your wannabes, uh, upward mobility, person upwardly mobile in social scene. No, it was the lowest dregs a woman could be in that day and time, which was to be a prostitute. She comes in and shows up and destroys every social moray ever written or every thought or ever thought about. She lets her hair down. 
letting one's hair down in biblical literature was only between a man and his wife, a husband and wife, in the intimacy behind closed doors. And yet she lets it down publicly. I imagine Simon to say, I could not have planned this any better. This is working out. I suspect in his jaded sense, he thought maybe this is a gift from God. I'm on the right track. Get rid of this guy. It's going to be easy. And now she is touching him, wetting his feet and washing him with her tears, and then drying his feet with her hair and put anointing oil on the sores of his feet from the rubble outside in everyday life. And now she's even kissing his feet. Now the biblical image of kissing one's feet, it was reserved for someone who had saved your life. You will find it in the Bible when someone has saved your life. It is appropriate adoration to fall down and kiss their feet. I suspect Simon is saying, I wonder what the first shot I will fire over the bow to get this thing going will be. The fact that he even knows who she is, and that may be enough to destroy him. What kind of prophet is he really if he doesn't know what kind of woman is touching him? Well, he did. But he didn't have to be a prophet to know what kind of woman it was who was touching him. We can conceive that he's already known her because the key is she's kissing his feet in the fashion as one who has been saved by the recipient of that kiss. He has met her before. And I imagine Simon's mind is going, I wonder if he met her in a professional capacity. Oh, surely not. Not even this lowlife teacher, rabbi, would self-destruct in such a manner. But the fact that he keeps company with her and has been associated with him, her is enough to destroy him. Now, many have speculated because the woman has no name. Some say it was Mary Magdalene, the one Jesus supposedly cast out seven different demons. Some say it's another Mary. But the most intriguing, I find, is the proposal that this woman was the woman out of the 8th chapter of John. And you may remember that one. And Jesus is doodling in the sand and they brought out this woman who was caught in the act of adultery or in an adulterous type act, which could have included prostitution. And they were going to stone her. And they say, what do you think, Rabbi? And Jesus says, let he who is without sin cast that first stone. And they all went away. And where are those who condemn you? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And it would fit puzzle in some way that this was this woman and Luke recorded her response to the literal saving of her life from being stoned. And Jesus accepts her adoration. St. Luke writes with such a depth this story. I could preach for four Sundays on it from a different angle. 
There are so many perspectives to be learned. With great skill, Luke tells this tale. But we all end up being drawn into the story. How do you feel about that prostitute? How do you feel about Simon? How do you feel about the men wrapped around the... There were no women, they weren't allowed. Around that table. What, what's going on here? I think all of us might point, as, as, as you've been in this parish for a number of years, many of you, we might point, well, he's going, Richard's going to ping on the self-righteousness of the Pharisee. He's not going to come down hard on the prostitute. I see Dr. Christie smiling. He knows me. But you know, it strikes me when I began to pick out Simon's sin of self-righteousness, I have taken the place of Simon. In my own self-righteousness, I have said self-righteousness is worse than prostitution. Have I not? I indict myself. Or... We could take, Jesus loves everybody, no matter where they are in their pilgrimage in life, and no matter what we do, and that is a true statement. But we must also ask, does not love include removal of the very thing that is killing the life in us? Does not an understanding of God's love include within it the removal of the very thing that got us in a wreck as a wreck in, in the first place? And Jesus said, the one that has been forgiven much loves much. And the one that has been forgiven little Loves little. And I guess that means that the one who understands her or his own brokenness to the max develops a sense of mercy because they have been forgiven much. And the one who thinks they've been a pretty good Joe or Jane or Susie, my goodness, they don't need a whole lot of forgiving because they live the straight and narrow life. So their margin of mercy becomes very small. I am always baffled in perspectives of American Christianity. That the theologically conservative oftentimes measure of mercy is quite small. It shouldn't be, but it is. And I wonder if it's because we who believe that we have I have high moral standards, believe we have followed those standards more closely than other human beings. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And you scratch that surface, you will find oftentimes there are certain sins that just outweigh the sins we are already doing and don't realize. Then I find the theologically liberal, and I'm going to use those terms because textbooks use those terms. I have no idea what they mean. They often have a margin of mercy that is great and huge. And yet at the same time, 
one begins to wonder if they really take seriously evil. And the things we do that destroy other human beings' lives and hopes and love and soul, they tend to run the gamut of cheap grace. For those of us who read this text and become theologically confused, I'm only going to underscore one point. And in three years, you can come back on the same day in lectionary year, and I'll preach on the second point. I would put to you, God cares more about our future than God cares about our past. God cares more about what happens in the next moment than God cares about the wrong I have done in 64 years of living. The next moment is the most important. The future of what I do now after hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes significant. In God's kingdom, self-righteousness, which many of us might ping on, and prostitution only differ because of the object. But they're considered to be brokenness. Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. What is going to happen from the day this moment on becomes highly significant in our lives. Where we go from here when we hear that we are forgiven. If you believe that I'm not talking about you this morning. Then I would give you a course of self-reflection. You know, I've gotten to the point in my life, I just think every day I get up, I've got to do over life. If we ever change the name of the church, we ought to call it Do Over Presbyterians. Seriously. Seriously. Do over. Our eyes set on the future. We begin here in the present and put our lives in the hand of a God who can lead us. But the question is do we want to be led? I believe the gospel, and certainly the Greek word euvangelion, means good news. My friends, no matter what's happened in your past, where you've erred, God waits for you in the future. And truth be told, Simon should have gotten down from his seat at the head of the table and sat and helped the prostitute dry at Jesus' feet. Anoint his feet. Kiss his feet. But from where we sit today, Simon's future looks pretty bleak. As so many have said, when we bask in anger and judgment and criticism and persecution of other individuals, we will reap that same reward. And for the woman, her future looks bright. For she, without a doubt, has learned what true love means. To leave what is behind 
and to press on to the upward calling in Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm.